OK, let's take a look at your thoughts on these questions. Question one, how would you describe Mrs. Slade and Mrs. Ansley and their relationship? One group took this question. Uh, and they focused actually on the relationship because this story seems to be built around the relationship between these two women. According to this group, these two women are friends and rivals. Uh, they have a long relationship with each other that uh, in like social situations, they are very friendly, but secretly, in fact, they are always compete competing with each other. Uh, but we get most of this information from part one. And most of part one is from the perspective of Mrs. Slade. Right, if you if we look at uh, the history between them, um, let's see. Well, I guess most of part one is the history. So let's say page thirty. Uh, so Mrs. Slade and Mrs. Ansley had lived opposite each other, actually as well as figuratively for years. When the drawing room curtains in one place were renewed, the other place across the street was always aware. Uh, and a lot of things happened in their life. Little of it escaped Mrs. Slade. So it seems like the person who's being competitive is Mrs. Slade. Maybe Mrs. Ansley is also competitive, but we don't know at this point. There's only one paragraph in the whole story that is told from the perspective of Mrs. Ansley. And that paragraph takes place on page 31. So we have spent the last page thinking about uh, how would Mrs. Slade describe Mrs. Ansley? What does she think of her friend? And now the story gives us the reverse perspective. Mrs. Ansley was much less articulate than her friend, and her mental portrait of Mrs. Slade was slighter and drawn with fainter touches. Alita Slade's awfully brilliant, but not as brilliant as she thinks would have summed it up. Uh, though she would have added for the enlightenment of strangers that Mrs. Slade had been an extremely dashing girl, much more so than her daughter, who was pretty, of course, and clever in a way, but had none of her mother's, well, vividness, someone had once called it. So here we do have some hints of a feeling of competition. Right, uh, Slade is brilliant, but not that brilliant. Uh, Slade used to be extremely pretty. Um, but, but the next sentence, Mrs. Ansley would take up current words like this and cite them in quotation marks as unheard of audacities. This word would is very tricky. It could mean that this entire paragraph is is not actually happening, right? The, the paragraph is, uh, what if Mrs. Ansley described Mrs. Slade? But Ansley is not actually describing Slade. So this would could be subjunctive, jasa yuchi. But, it could also mean that Ansley has the habit of doing this. Would can mean a kind of habit, it's something that Ansley would usually do, right? I say would usually do. And if it is describing a kind of habit, then the person describing the habit is not the person doing the thing, right? It's an observer. Um, describing someone's habit, you 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 don't say I would have the habit of doing something. 
right? You know whether you do it or not. Um, you wouldn't say I would have the habit. You would say this person would have the habit. You're so this if this would is describing somebody else's habit, the person describing it cannot be the same person. What I'm trying to say is if this would means a kind of habit, then even this paragraph is from the perspective of Mrs. Slade. It's Mrs. Slade imagining how Mrs. Ansley might describe Mrs. Slade. So this could be the one paragraph from Mrs. Ansley's perspective, or it could still be Mrs. Slade's perspective. So in the end, in this story, we don't have any point that is absolutely certain to be from Mrs. Ansley. So in this question, their relationship is competitive. That's true. Probably more competitive from Slade than from Ansley. Although, you know, by the end of the story, Ansley is also very competitive. Uh, nobody forces Ansley to admit her secret, right? She decides to do it herself. That's pretty competitive. Uh, and so we also get a clear picture of Mrs. Slade. She loves to compete with her friend and rival. Um, there's a part of the story that says uh, Slade thinks that her own daughter is too boring. Uh, Right. She wished that Jenny would fall in love with the wrong man, even that she might have to be watched, outmaneuvered, rescued. And instead, it was Jenny who watched her mother. So we know that Slade likes to have an exciting life. She likes to do things. She likes to to interact with people. As for Ansley, I guess what we know is that she's quieter and it turns out she does have a secret so we can also say that Ansley is more careful Slade kind of just blurts out she Slade doesn't want to tell her secret but something inside her is forcing her to say it out loud whereas for Ansley she kept her mouth shut until the very end of the story so she is like more in control of her self uh, so it's like maybe Mrs. Slade is more insecure. That's why she wants to compete. That's why she wants to try to hurt Ansley by telling her the secret. And so Ansley is more secure in her position in life. Question two, today's most popular question. How might the story be different if told from the other person's point of view? So very quickly, if you have not yet finished the story, the key point is uh, there are two key points. Uh, each woman has a secret. Mrs. Slade's secret is that when they were younger, she wrote a letter pretending to be her future husband, uh, or wrote it to Mrs. Ansley, asking her out on a nighttime date. Mrs. Ansley's secret is that she went on the date and actually met uh, Delphin Slade because she replied to the letter and so he came. And they slept together and nine months later, she gave birth to Barbara. So that's the story. So the structure of the story is Mrs. Slade has a secret, but she doesn't know that Mrs. Ansley has a bigger secret. Mrs. Ansley has a secret, and she has no idea why Mrs. Slade is bringing, bringing up these past events. So since we're following the story from Slade's perspective, it becomes a kind of reverse detective story. Uh, in the process of telling her secret, Slade realizes that there is more information behind it that she doesn't know. And it's kind of like she 
discovers this new information, even though she doesn't want to know. Right in a detective story, the detective wants more information. He wants usually he wants to find the truth. But in this story, Slade does not actually know that there is a mystery and all every piece of new information that she discovers is not because she wants to. It's kind of just presented to her. Um, whereas for Mrs. Ansley, she has a big secret. She, uh, when Mrs. Slade reveals something new about the past, uh, it turns out Mrs. Slade knows a little more, but doesn't really know Ansley's secret. And so if the story were told from Mrs. Ansley's point of view, it would be more like every new thing that Mrs. Slade says, does she know? Does this mean that she knows? And it turns out, no, she doesn't know. And then she says something new again. Oh no, am I going to be discovered? Turns out, no. So when we follow Mrs. Slade, we get new pieces of information that are uh, very damaging to Slade. But when we follow Mrs. Ansley, every new piece of information is a threat, but nothing bad ever happens to Ansley. And so if Mrs. Slade is an offensive story, like we're going on the offense and we're actively doing things and things are actively changing, then if we follow Mrs. Ansley, it would be more like a defensive story. Like things keep happening to her and she has to make sure that she is still safe and that her secret is still safe. All the way to the very end, when finally after Mrs. Slade has exhausted everything she wants to say, it's Mrs. Ansley's turn to reveal something. And that is the winning blow, let's say. So the stories would feel very different. Since we're following Slade, we don't know the big secret until the very end. But if we follow Ansley, we would always know the big secret and we would in fact be worried about does Mrs. Slade know? Uh, it's a very different kind of story. It's kind of like uh, it, the story we have is more like a detective story. And the story from the other point of view would be like the serial killer trying not to get caught, right? Trying to keep the fact a secret. It's kind of like uh, there is a movie recently called Trap. The, I don't know if you went to see this. Um, the main character is a serial killer. He takes his daughter to like a kind of like a, a pop concert, like a Taylor Swift concert. Turns out the whole concert is a trap to catch him. And so the story follows how he finds out about the trap and how he manages to escape or not. So it would feel like a very different story simply because of the information imbalance or information asymmetry. Questions three to four. Why does Mrs. Slade envy Mrs. Ansley? One group took this question, uh, and I think the answer is quite clear. Mrs. Slade envies Mrs. Ansley because Barbara Ansley is such an exciting girl. Um, I think throughout the story, we get a clear sense that Mrs. Slade thinks she herself has the better life, had the better husband, had the more exciting uh, social career, Everything is great, except her own daughter is just really boring, right? Um, so this would be the most obvious thing to envy Mrs. Ansley. But why? Why is this so important? This group pointed to a key piece of information. Why is it so important to have a, an exciting daughter? If we go to page 33, Um, so this paragraph, Mrs. Ansley had resumed her knitting. And Mrs. Slade thinks she's in the middle of Rome, the most beautiful site in the world. How could she start knitting at this place? And then she thinks, but no, she was simply absorbed in her work. What was there for her to worry about? Mrs. Ansley has nothing to worry about. 
She knew that Babs would almost certainly come back engaged to the extremely eligible Campolieri, and she'll sell the New York house and settle down near them in Rome and never be in their way. She's much too tactful. But she'll have an excellent cook and just the right people in for bridge and cocktails and a perfectly peaceful old age among her grandchildren. So we see that Slade imagines Ansley's end of life will be perfect. And the reason it will be perfect is because her exciting daughter will catch the perfect man. So it's not just about, oh, whose daughter is better. It's about what that means for these two older women. Both of them have lost their husbands. Uh, neither of them has like really uh, important career left for them. Uh, and so their futures will be tied to their children's future. So Slade envies Ansley because she has the more exciting daughter, which means she'll probably have the better uh, old age. Question four, there's a paragraph of pure, oh, nobody took this question. There's a paragraph of description on page 36. Why is it there? So let's go to page 36. This one. The clear heaven overhead was emptied of all its gold. Dusk spread over it, abruptly darkening the seven hills. Here and there, lights began to twinkle through the foliage at their feet. Steps were coming and going on the deserted terrace, waiters looking out of the doorway at the head of the stairs, then reappearing with trays and napkins and flasks of wine. Tables were moved, chairs straightened. A feeble string of electric lights flickered out. Some vases of faded flowers were carried away and brought back replenished. A stout lady in a dust coat suddenly appeared, asking in broken Italian if anyone had seen the elastic band which held together her tattered Baedeker. She poked with her stick under the table at which she had lunched, the waiters assisting. This entire paragraph not one mention of Slade or Ansley or any character we already know. This entire paragraph seems to be doing something very different from the rest of the story. So the question is, why? Why is it here? Um, by the way, elastic band is the old name for rubber band. And Badeker is a very popular tourist guide. So the woman is looking for her guidebook, basically, uh, is looking for the rubber band that held together her guidebook. Speaking of holding things together, um, for those of you at home, my microphone cord just dropped to the ground. So, in order to, it seems like this is kind of a transition, right? It says the sky grew dark and like the restaurant is preparing for dinner. So it's telling us that time is passing. So if this is a transition, then it seems like the importance lies in what is it transitioning from and where is it transitioning to? What is this paragraph connecting? So let's look. The previous paragraph, um, Slade has revealed her secret, and then uh, she talks about what happened after, after um, Ansley's nighttime, um, let's call it a date. Uh, it's it's a rendezvous, a nighttime rendezvous. Uh, you were married to Horace Ansley two months afterward. As soon as you could get out of bed, your mother rushed you off to Florence and married you. 
People were rather surprised. They wondered at its being done so quickly. I had an idea you did it out of pique because you were annoyed with me. To be able to say you'd got ahead of Delphin and me. And then it, Mrs. Anz was like, yes, I suppose it would. Like, <laughs> which is a non-answer. <laughs> so at this point, it feels like Slade has all the information that there is for her to discover. At this point, it feels like Slade knows the entire story. But what happens after? For a long time, neither of them spoke. At length, Mrs. Slade began again. I suppose I did it as a sort of joke. This woman cannot keep her mouth shut. She cannot hold in her secret, and then after she discovers everything she thinks there is to know, she still has to try to poke Mrs. Ansley. Like, writing a fake letter, pretending to be the man that her friend loves, is a very cruel thing to do. And here she says, I suppose I did it as a sort of joke. It's like, it's a very... So, like, torturing me is a joke to you? That kind of feeling. Uh, so, again, like, Slade cannot keep her mouth shut. The more she talks, the deeper a hole she's digging for herself. And because of this... Oh, sorry, so this is just about the letter. Yeah, she does, this is not yet about the date. But this is about the letter. And so because she says this, Mrs. Ansley has the excuse to tell her the truth. I didn't wait. He'd arranged everything. He was there. We were let in at once. Um, so this is the first part of the story where Mrs. Ansley has a secret and is revealed to Slade and revealed to us. Right before this, it's all about Mrs. Slade's secret about the fake letter. But here is where we get our first twist. So this paragraph is kind of separating the two secrets. Before this, it's all Slade. And then after this, as dusk turns to evening, as lunch turns to dinner, Control goes from Slade to Ansley. It's a metaphorical transition for a narrative transition. Uh, Which leads us to question five. Why is the story divided into two parts? Uh, a few groups took this question. Uh, and you guys noticed some very interesting points about the difference uh, between these two parts. The most obvious thing to say is that the first part is mostly description about the past, and nothing really happens in the first part. The Whatever is put in part one has already happened. Nothing changes. Whereas part two is where everything changes and we get new information about the past. So in fact, we need part one because part two changes what we learn in part one. The, there's only a twist in part two if we know what is being twisted in part one. We have to have a starting point. We have to have a basic standard in order to understand just how important the secrets in part two are. There's also a difference in, as we were just saying, like the, the who is in control of the story. Part one is mostly description, but it is entirely or almost entirely from the perspective of Mrs. Slade. So everything we learn about their relationship, everything we learn about the characters, we learn from this biased point of view. She is in control of part one. 
But part two, even when Slade is talking, even when she is revealing secrets, she's only doing that because for some reason Ansley annoys her. She looks at Ansley, she feels envy, she feels jealous, she feels like oh, it's the old rivalry come back. I need to be better than her. And so she slowly reveals her secret in spite of herself. So even when Slade is talking in part two, it's Ansley who's in control. Ansley is influencing how the situation develops. And then, of course, finally, uh, part two is where we learn that the real secret, the big secret, is in Mrs. Ansley's hands and not Mrs. Slade's. So we could say part one belongs to Slade, part two belongs to Ansley. And then finally, uh, one more idea I heard was that um, part one takes place in the afternoon, whereas in part two, the day is growing dark, right? We have this transition into the nighttime. So we can also talk about the symbolism of day and night. Day is connected with everyday life, is connected with uh, enlightenment, rational, legal, law systems, doing things the objective and correct way. The night is connected with private life, personal life, personal details, secrets, secret meetings, um, and strange events. Something that happens during the day would feel, uh, can feel very different when it happens at night. For example, if I send you a line message at 1 p.m., it would feel very different if I sent you the same message at 1 a.m. So simply the difference between day and night can give a whole new meaning to the same event. And indeed, in this story, part one feels like, oh, it's the official story. It's the introduction to these two characters. And then part two is like when things start getting weird and we have new and different information that changes our understanding of what's going on. So. When we think about all of these differences between part one and part two, it feels like the story is very carefully designed. Two characters, two secrets, two times of day, two parts of the story, two different people in control. And the fun in this story is to show how in this division into two parts and two people, which person is in control, which person has the upper hand is always unpredictable. Okay, do you have questions about uh, today's discussion or the story? Okay, so I know I revealed the ending, but if you have not yet finished, it's really worth uh, reading to the end. Because part one is more description, it can get a little boring, but part two is just like a really fascinating conversation. And in fact, now that you know the ending, you can get more out of their conversation. Like as we said um, in part two, and many times when Slade asks or says something to Mrs. Ansley, Mrs. Ansley just says, yeah, I suppose you're right. Yeah, that could make sense. Yeah, you're probably right. All the time, she knows in her heart that it's not right because Slade doesn't know about uh, Barbara's true father. Um, so like, and then like when Slade reveals um, the letter was written by herself, Mrs. Ansley's response, right? First she cries and then uh, she kind of like gets angry. It's just not what Mrs. Slade is expecting. And by the end, we realize why. So this is really a story that's worth uh, finishing or even reading a second time uh, to really get that experience. Okay, so that's this week.
Next week, we're going to read another short story by Jack London called To Build a Fire. Jack London is a very important writer in American literary history because he was the major representative of a movement called naturalism. The story we just read is an example of realism. It's supposed to be written in a way that feels like real life. The events may not be common events, but the way that they are presented is supposed to reflect how people actually behave and what people would actually do and think in that situation. Now, of course, we have different ideas of how a normal person would behave, but the assumption is that most people would agree that's what uh, people might do. But in naturalism, it's slightly different. Yes, the people behave in rational ways, but the world of the story is not a rational world, or you can say it's a coldly rational world. The world of a naturalist story is impersonal. It has no sentiment or feelings. It doesn't care about human beings. The universe continues as it ever has with no regard for human life or human experience. In the naturalist story, no God comes down to save us from whatever. So like, you know, in Roman fever, at the end of the story, Mrs. Ansley gains the upper hand. That would never happen in a naturalist story. Nothing changes at the end. It's always according to what you expect. And it's usually never a good ending. To build a fire is the story of a man in Alaska. He's trying to get from point A to point B. But apparently there's going to be a blizzard, a snowstorm, and the temperature is going to drop really fast, really quickly. But he thinks, you know, I can probably beat the storm. I can get there before it gets too cold. Uh, you know, and then just from this introduction, you know he's not going to make it. It's called to build a fire because when it gets too cold and, you know, he accidentally gets wet, he has to save himself by finding heat. And the, the only way to find heat in that place is to build a fire. But it sounds easy. But things go wrong. And he tries again. And it goes wrong again. And it keeps going wrong until the end of the story. So that's basically uh, to build a fire. It's written in, uh, we'll talk about this next week, but it's written in simpler language than Roman fever. Roman fever is full of, uh, $50 words full of lengthy sentences, shifting perspectives. Jack London was a popular author. He was not a literary author. He wrote for everyday people to read. So his language is simpler. It's easier to understand. He was also a very successful author. Um, so you can see that the ideas of naturalism were not just um, for literature, but it was throughout the culture of the U.S. at the time. And one reason naturalism was so popular is because it did feel like in the second half of the 19th century and the first part of the 20th century that nobody really cared about regular people. Rich people were getting richer. Workers had to work more and more, die younger and younger. The government was bought off by rich people. Nobody really cared. The economy kept crashing. There was like three crashes in 10 years. Uh, and so when writers like Jack London wrote stories about how the world doesn't care about us regular people, it really resonated. Yo, gan. Yeah, so that's next week. I do have one announcement to make. I should have realized this earlier.
but I will not be here on week 14. Uh, I knew I would not be here before the semester started. I just forgot about it. So that week, um, it will be in your second handout, the story for you to read that week. The discussion questions are here. Um, so, uh, and it's a very good story. It's one of, actually, it's one of my favorite stories. Uh, I can't believe it's that week. So instead of coming here to discuss it, and then I talk at you for an hour, um, I have presented you with a link to my lecture on this story from last year. And so after reading the story and looking at the discussion questions, you can follow along with last year's lecture. Um, and that's how we're going to handle that. Um, but last year I did not teach week 15 Sylvia Plath. So week 13, after um, the end of the discussion, I will introduce week 14 and introduce week 15. Right, okay. Questions about anything? Okay, so uh, you now have some time to begin reading next week's story. And if you have not yet signed in, please come sign in. <laughs>